This is the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Voice of Early Childhood podcast. My name is Angelica Salinska. I'm your host. And today I'm joined by Kamala Garcia Manas once again who is the headmistress of Miss Daisy's Chelsea and PhD researcher at University of Dundee in Scotland. So this episode is part of our series around Carmela's PhD research, all around education for sustainability through sociodramatic play. And in the first episode, Carmela discussed the context of her research and her aims. In the second episode, she introduced the first theme that emerged from her research, which was around young children's perceptions of poverty and race. And in this episode, Carmela will be discussing possession as a form of power. So really interesting, intriguing topic and title there, Carmela. Firstly, thank you very much for joining again to share your research. Thank you, Angelica. And secondly, let's get straight into discussing this topic. So Carmela, what do we mean by possession? Is it material possession? You also talk in your article about unequal possession of goods. Let's unpick what we mean by this. Yes, so in the previous episode, um, we discussed that the current climate crisis is partly caused by the way we produce, consume and distribute uh, resources as Mm -hmm. if they were unlimited. Uh, Now, this unequal distribution of resources reflects societal disparities and and just worsens issues that are purely, um, purely related to sustainability, such as inequality. Um, therefore, uh, what I wanted to do uh, was to explore how the possession of goods in the peer culture is it relates to power dynamics, uh, mm-hmm. especially in the context of, of social sustainability. And then what I wanted to achieve is to, um, to somehow get uh, children's, young children's perspectives on, on how um, possession of goods uh, done mm-hmm. in my drama sessions take the form of water, and all their basic goods, just food. Uh, how does how what the perspectives are in terms and how it relates to power dynamics in relation to sustainability. Mm-hmm. And um, what I wanted to, I think it would be better if I give a brief introduction of what possession of goods uh, and power dynamics are and how mm-hmm. are they interrelated. So, yeah, that would the be possession- great. Perfect. So exploring the possessions of goods uh, within the context of power dynamics uh, unveils integrate intersections with sustainability. Mm -hmm. Now, the unequal distribution of resources, what what it does, it it mirrors societal disparities. That amplifies issues such as inequality, which which is what we talk about. Now, the problem is that as studies reveal, access to essential goods like food and water not only addresses immediate needs, but also reflects broader socioeconomic inequalities. And these disparities, together with uh, uh, compounded by factors such as income inequality and wealth distribution that I mentioned in my article, contribute to significant health and, and social ramifications, uh, exacerbating the, the, the current sustainability yeah. challenges. That's mm-hmm. why it's incredibly important to understand and address these power dynamics uh, as early as possible in order to foster a more equi- equitable and, and sustainable uh, society. And again, early childhood uh, is the best time to do so. so that's one mm-hmm. of the So how did you find this out with children in terms of that to them? possession was a, it or is a form of power what what did this look like in the setting what does this look like to the children that's a that's a very interesting and this is what we are going to explore today indeed so uh the children first of all uh, my findings show that the children are very aware that possession involves power it carries mm-hmm. power with it and so they behave uh they behave or they act depending on this. And this is what I have seen in the different social drama sessions. I want to also highlight that um, although in my drama, in my social drama sessions, um, the goods were taken the form of basic goods, such as water or food, 
this mm-hmm. happens daily in in an early childhood education setting as is innate for children to share and, and take turns and this normally involves um, material things mm-hmm. and, and so possession so uh, I would like to I think I'm going to start by explaining one of the sessions that uh, uh, where possession of as a form of power became very evident and mm-hmm. and, 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 and 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 the theme uh, although um, it came out from a pattern that I found in different sessions and not only on that one. I think uh, this session also will, will be able to give us a better um, picture of what possession as form of power means in, in an early childhood education, uh, mm-hmm. in, in early childhood education. So I would like, uh, Angelica, you to imagine that there are two families. I have the children to split into two groups. These were two okay. families. And they had to choose a role in the family, that they could be the mm-hmm. grandma, they could be the grandfather, they could be the child. Interestingly, which is, this is a different topic that we may discuss in the future. Interestingly, uh, most of the children chose to be either the babies or the grandmothers or grandfathers or grandparents. Okay. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. But that's, again, that's a different, a different topic. Mm-hmm. And so the children had to go and find some food for the family. So I set up outdoors. We had two lovely apple, apple trees, um, mm-hmm. but unfortunately didn't have apples by that time. So I had to hang two apples from two different trees mm-hmm. uh, with a string. So the families went outside, and one of the families didn't have any resources to be able to reach the apples, such as boxes, planks, and so all kind of resources, while the other family had boxes, a ladder, and so on. So they could put together mm-hmm. somehow to reach the apple. Now, when the first family reached the apple, the child who reached the apple went to the to the other family that couldn't reach the apple and were showing lots of signs of frustration and so on. Mm-hmm. And, and with the box in her hands, uh, she said, okay, let me choose who is going to reach the apple. This is the first sign that we see uh, as as possession as a form of power, the child mm. knows that that box gives you the power or the possibility to reach the apple. Mm-hmm. She doesn't perhaps she doesn't she doesn't leave the box next to the family, saying, "Look, here is a box." She goes and chooses personally a child mm. who will be the child who will reach the apple. So she is uh, in this case using her authority, and that authority comes from the power she has gained mm-hmm. by owning the box, by possessing mm-hmm. the box, the resource that they need to reach the apple. Of course, there are different children that at this point will say, please give it to me, um, you are so good. They start giving her, a child starts giving her some compliments just to see mm-hmm. if uh, that child will be the child. That works. <laughs> yeah. that, that works in real life, so <laughs> it's a good strategy. Um, and then the child chooses another child. So let's say child A and child B. Child B uses a box to reach the apple. And then child B says, I have the apple. I am now the judge. Mm. And this is another very interesting comment from the child. Not only because he is immediately uh, acquiring that that role of 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 power. Let's say I have the apple, so now I have decide. I'm going to decide what to do with the apple, but also because the child is aware that a judge some somehow holds that role of authority of power. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. Then the two families go inside and they. And this, I asked them, yes, this is your apple, so you choose. Let's go inside and perhaps eat it. And uh, the two families sit down in, in different areas in the classroom. And while family A um, it chooses to share the apple equally, they use a cu- an apple cutter mm-hmm. that cuts the apple in eight pieces. And in the family, there are four members. So in family in family A, the children get two slices of apple each. Mm -hmm. So the one who reached the apple in family A decided to share the apple equally. 
Family B, on the contrary, the child who gets the apple, uh, decides to first bite it <laughs> on the way to the classroom because at the end of the day, that child shall be rich the apple <laughs> for, for him to choose what to do. And after that, I provide him with a new apple, of course, after this. And, um, and after that, he decides to cut the apple with the apple cutter. And then is when he starts to give in directions to the other family members, such mm -hmm. as I am the only, and repeating again, I'm only the judge because I had it in my hands. Mm -hmm. Continues by saying things such as I have to find the, the your data, your notes. <laughs> I, um, I have to find the notes because it's very interesting and I want to literally quote what the child is. <laughs> I'm really intrigued. <laughs> it's actually very, very interesting how. And whilst whilst you're looking for um, the notes, what you've said so far made me feel like the the feeling of power that the children got from having the apple was displayed in a way of decision making. So that's how they felt powerful. They can make a decision. So the first child making a decision who gets the box to reach the apple rather than just passing them the box, like you said. And then the second child, when they said that they are the judge, and again, they make decision on how to share the apple. That again is, is that display of power through, I can make the decisions. I can judge what is happening here because I was really interested in initially from here in the title of this this topic um what what does it mean to have power to the children how do they display it um how do they show that they have power how how does it how do you um identify that they have showed that they have power so for me kind of what you've said so far it seems as if it's the power is held in the decision making aspects so it'd be interesting yeah. to hear what what your your thoughts were on your on your own data. I'm kind of skipping ahead here. I feel like with my own interpretations. <laughs> oh, perfect, perfect. Because it also gave me the time to find the data. So <laughs> that. Um, so yes, you are completely right. I think he's very much linked to decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and uh, and also the the power of influence as well. But we will mm -hmm. soon discover that there is much more behind. Um, um, behind it, um, and not only related to decision making, and okay. and and the impact it also has uh, on the individuals and on the mm -hmm. group as a group. So going back to to my notes, um, mm -hmm. here the child says, "Okay, I only choose who is sitting nicely." Oh. So this is also very interesting because before the child declares himself as or appoints himself a judge. And now mm -hmm. what the child is doing is imitating what the teacher will say. Mm -hmm. This shows a um, certain level of awareness of what um, authority uh, means and who has, um, who has the authority in the classroom, which is the teacher. Mm -hmm. What is also interesting is that the three family members, none of them speaks out at this point, and they all follow the child's orders. They all sit down as soon as the child says who is sitting nicely. Mm -hmm. And they all help uh, to cut the apple, but still, after helping, they will return the apple to this child, somehow acknowledging his powerful position, his authority mm -hmm. position. And again, he continues, who is sitting nicely? I'm going to give a slice to who is sitting nicely. This is <laughs> this is the child. And the problem here, as you can see, what the child is doing is taking on, on the role of that that authority role mm -hmm. and, and drawing as well on the teacher's authority, you know, experiencing as well with it a sense of empowerment somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think that in this case, it, the, the, the child also is adopting the teacher's role just to, to somehow enhance his, his authority. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and, and Italy not only ac- accepted it, but also replicated this 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 behavior of, as if the child was actually the teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and and then, uh, I was just going to ask, what role did this child play in the family that they set up? What role did they choose? Well, he was the grandfather. He was and the that's grandfather. a very good question. But he was sharing the role of grandfather with another child that was also in the in the family. I wanted mm-hmm. to explore as well power dynamics. That's actually a very good point because it it somehow may may have been related to the role they decided mm-hmm. to, to on uh, at the start of the session. But again, mm-hmm. the roles were a bit um were a bit all over the place. We had two mm-hmm. grandparents and two babies. Um <laughs> and, and uh, but, but no one was behaving as a grandparent will somehow act or behave or react or, or a baby will be, behave and react. But mm. what happened here is that this child sees how the other family is sharing equally. However, this child uh, decides to share the apple unequally. So this child got himself three slices, um, <laughs> gave other <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gave two children one slide and the other one two slices. Which obviously caused a certain level of disappointment, and one of the children mm-hmm. uh, present uh, ended up crying, and then this oh, led no. to, into uh, the reflection. Uh, we all sat down and 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 talk about it and how that mm-hmm. made us feel. And but this also shows how important it is to to as a teacher, an educator, as an adult, to to first take into account that children do explore. Uh, this power dynamics uh, through the possession of goods mm-hmm. okay. and and the importance of us um, of us acting as guides in this kind of situations that in this case again it took the form of an apple uh, but it happens every day in every setting in every little corner of the world mm-hmm. Hiya! Just quickly, I wanted to ask a favour from all of the listeners and viewers. It would really help this podcast if you subscribe on the platform you are listening or watching on. This will help the Voice of Early Childhood podcast to continue putting out thought-provoking and reflective episodes with a range of guests. And if you are enjoying listening to this podcast, please do share it with someone else who you think would love it too. And of course, as always, we encourage you to share your voice too. If you have reflections, thoughts and comments, please do share this episode on social media with your comments and tag the voice of early childhood. Let's keep these thought-provoking discussions going. Thank you. I'll let you get back to the episode now. And uh, I've, as you were talking, I've been taking some notes. I thought it was really interesting when you discussed the fact that the child felt that level of authority and acted in that way and then the other children accepted that it kind of reminded me of um research around conformity and assignment of roles and actually um zimbardo's stanford prison experiment (laughs) funnily enough (laughs) which can't be any any more different from what you're doing here of course (laughs) um ethically but it did remind me of that research around you know if you're assigned a role you you conform to that role. Everyone else conforms to the, to their roles as well. And there's those power imbalances, um, and those those power dynamics that are present there. But everyone kind of just still still goes with it um, and really plays to their roles, which is really interesting. Um, and then also considering whether that particular child again that the roles of the family members seem to not really. I guess matter that much to the children in the end, potentially, um, from what you said. Um, they didn't really seem to to kind of have that much of an impact on them. So I wonder if um it's the child's level of confidence in themselves, you know, that they had. Is is that child particularly confident to to make those decisions and and to assign it themselves that role? of I'm I'm the the almost like the leader here I'm the judge or is it is it because they were given the apple <laughs> they were the chosen one or, or maybe they were given the apple because maybe they're perhaps the in quotation marks the more popular child the more confident child or did it make them feel more confident well I think I think of course the, the fact that the the other child uh from family A chose him to to as as the one to to 
to have the box and so be able to reach the apple um, did did help uh, mm-hmm. in in terms of giving him uh, a sense of empowerment some yeah. somehow. Uh, but I also I think we also have to take into consideration that in this situation it may not only be or solely be uh, the possessions of materials that leads to those power imbalances among children, but also the the unequal the unequal distribution mm-hmm. of the resources beforehand. Perhaps we will be in a completely different situation if the, these two families were given an apple without having to reach it or compete somehow for it. Mm. Um, and or perhaps it would be also diff- it would have been different if the children had four apples. Um, so this is quite a complex scenario as well because we are somehow expecting children to share equally when. What the, the beginning on the starting line we give them is is based on mm-hmm. unequal distribution somehow, and 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 that lack of of resources as well. You know, there's just one apple, and they sense it, and mm-hmm. perhaps that also led them to to compete for for the apple somehow. Yeah. You know, so mm-hmm. this is something that we need to 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 take into consideration, uh, and I have taken into consideration and made notes as well. In my thesis, because um, there are a lot of variables. There's, there are always a lot of variables, Angelica, when yeah. <laughs> exploring data somehow. Yes, but I, also, but I also want to mention that um, this also somehow changed uh, over the program. What we are talking, we're talking about session two. Mm-hmm. Now, there are other examples of, of possession of, of goods uh, as a form of power uh, at the very end or in the very last sessions. And, and things have, uh, things is slightly changed by that time mm-hmm. um, in terms of conformity as well, as you were talking about conformity mm-hmm. and the, the research. Like, for example, we have the water session that uh, we, we talked about in the last episode yeah. uh, where the children had to find water. Then we have another child that uh, finds a container with water and, and other children in the group ask this child to hold the, the water can, but the child um, um, denies this request mm-hmm. and, uh, and says, I will give you water. And although this child was very fair when sharing the water, trying to fill everyone's cups and everyone's containers and and for everyone to have water, uh, for that child, it was very difficult to to share the the power uh, uh, holding the water container uh, brings or carries or implies. So, which which shows you that it's not much of, about having those resources um, or those goods, but about the power. Um, mm-hmm. Of 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 sharing or of distributing it, which mm. is very interesting as well, because this is what you see as well in the in the wider world in the adult society yeah. somehow. Um, and the children didn't speak out in this case; they accepted. And and in fact, one of the children said at some point took a flower and approached this child who was holding the container and said, "I am making something for you for being good." So it's somehow celebrating no, that uh, the child is displaying fairness by um, sharing the water with all children as equally as possible, and and also showing that um, some somehow recognizing the power that that child is holds, no, by by mm-hmm. by holding the water container and trying to find you know somehow the favor of that child, um, mm. giving that child something. Um, as 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 he says in his comment, I'm making something for you for being good. Very interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, and it makes me again, again, I'm taking notes as as you talk. It makes me think of um, so possession of power being something that someone wants. So not necessarily possessing an object or you know possessing something. Actually, it needs to be something that other people want and need you know like like the food and the water that you're talking about so yeah it it depends on how much value is placed placed on those possessions 
Yes, yes, um, it is. And we also have to take into account that um, it's not only about how much you they desire that object or, or the good, but also the fact that by not having that possession or that good, mm. they may be excluded from play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that is one of the main concerns uh, of children uh, in early childhood, to be excluded, mm-hmm. uh, to not be invited into play. So I think there are a lot of things in play, not only the goods, but, you know, the status, um, the, the inclusion in, in the play and, and, and so on. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, actually. It makes me think of scenarios where there might be multiple, say if we're talking about, I don't know, a, a sand area and there may be multiple spades or shovels and the child wants a particular colour because everyone else has that. And then the practitioner may say, well, here's here's a yellow spade and he, he wants the blue one because everyone else has the blue one. So it's not about the fact that he wants the spade, it's about that, the fact that they want to be feel included. Um and it's not about the actual object. It's about how it makes them feel. And it's, yeah, it's, so it makes me feel like it's either that that competitiveness of like how much, how much, how much value does this object hold in terms of if I have it or if I don't have it? And then also how, how does it make me feel? It's really interesting to unpick all of this. And it's, it's so similar to us as adults in society. You know, we we pay more for certain things that are of value to us, um, you know, that that may, to other people may not seem as it, that's it's worth that amount of money because it's not of value to them. Um, and it also makes me think about um, that need to reward almost like good behavior you know like when you were saying earlier about um just trying to think of the example so like if you're if you're good if you're sitting nicely then you get the apple and things like that so we have to earn things by being good rather than just being given things it kind of a little bit reminds me of like um having to earn love or care and that kind of being quite unhealthy rather that than that unconditional love and again this is as we were exploring in the last episode this is a reflection of the adult world this is mm-hmm. what they learn in the adult world and 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 so it's reflected in in their play and and coming back to to how much value possessions of uh, not possession but the goods have um Corsaro is a very good author that explores this uh, in terms of gaining control and sharing which he believes are two key elements of peer culture and Engelmann and other authors agree on this. It's not about the goods themselves, but it's about the respect. And, and mm-hmm. that takes me back to the example that you talk about uh, with the sanctuary and the blue spade. It's not about the blue spade. It's about that respect. It's about mm-hmm. we all deserve the same. And and this is very interesting as well. And we will talk about it further in, in, in I think, two episodes. Mm-hmm. One of the episodes. That I will be where I will be exploring um, um, the concept of fairness and uh, as equal sharing, um, and we will talk more about it. But another thing I wanted to touch on is uh, continuing with um, this topic: possession as a form of power. Is that there was also a change in terms of conformity, the children's uh, conformity levels uh, by the end of the program. In, for example, the very last session, where the children need needed to role play different scenarios from different social drama sessions that we practice in the first um, Mm -hmm. part of the program. One of the children came by and went to the cash machine and took all the money. And at this point, the children, um, all the children that were present and saw it, spoke out and said, no, that's not yours. That's not fair. Mm -hmm. And and, and then the child at this point said, and I have to find it, but I remember either way. Mm-hmm. And this, this child said, no, no, don't worry. I'm going to share it. Mm. And, so and that, this is, yeah, I was going to say that's later down the line it, uh, after a few sessions. That's exactly. towards the end of the study. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a, the very last session indeed. And that's very interesting because the children at this point, uh, and, and it, it's shown in the data, not only in the theme of possession as a form of power, but 
in the themes such as diversity and perceiving fairness as equal sharing and so on, um, inclusion, exclusion, the children seem to have gained some skills that have uh, help and help them to to speak out um, when they see a, an unjust scenario or mm. an unfair scenario, which is in, in incredibly beautiful to see uh, because that was one of my aims as well uh, uh, in this program. Uh, but in this case, uh, this child assumed the control of the money uh, uh, by just taking it from the table. But at this very same time, he he also declared, "Look, I'm going to. I'm just declaring myself as the owner of this mm -hmm. money, as the sole possessor. But I'm going to share it. I'm going to be a fair boss. I'm going to be mm -hmm. a fair owner or a fair possessor. Like if it could be seen somehow as as deeming it acceptable to take sole possession of resources if the intention was to share them among peers." Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, immediately afterward, he, he proceeded to share the money. Children accepted this and waited for them to, to receive the, the amount of money. And he did share it with all the children. If only it was that, um, I guess, it's not that simple, not that easy in this study either. But if only it was like this in society where you can trust people. <laughs> um, and, and it kind of reminded me of like democracy and governments and, and trusting it to to share resources equally and, you know, according to the needs of, of the wider society and different societal groups. But they, yeah, yeah, it really all makes me think of how, so everything that we're talking about now, yeah, it really does link to wider society and social sustainability. So, you know, sharing and possess, have children have possessing things um, really links to that distribution of resources and access to services in society. And as we mentioned in the previous episode or, or, or the first one around children being the future politicians, the future scientists, you know, future educators, it's so important to address these kinds of issues with children that you are addressing in your research around these challenging topics and uh, social issues. And that's why it's so vital to, to have this awareness and understanding and confidence as an educator to address these issues. And that's again, when I kind of come back to how training is important for educators in terms of, you know, how do we address challenging topics like this with children? Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, training is, is, is incredibly necessary in all topics. Um, but I would say that it's also very important for us to, to understand that these situations, um, although they have been somehow provoked through provocations such as the role play scenarios mm -hmm. and so on, um, these are course in their everyday lives. Uh, there are, as educators and teachers, we witness situations of uh, that require sharing or taking turns mm -hmm. daily, several times. And so sometimes, sometimes I think, Angelica, when we think of education for sustainability in early childhood education, we think about going outside, growing, planting, picking up litter. Mm -hmm. um, and so we think somehow of either extra activities or activities that we can do with children surrounding mostly the environmental dimension. Uh, or we may also think of... Um, educational approaches such as forest school, which involves mm -hmm. auto learning or the curiosity approach um, that um, yeah, that highlights the importance of using uh, resources that we do or ha already have, uh, every, everyday objects and, and so recycle materials. Mm -hmm. uh, all of this to, to teach sustainability. But uh, what I really, the message I really want to send across is that is is not only about the activities that you prepare. It's not about that extra. It's it's about making the most of the day, because we mm -hmm. find these power dynamics related to the possession of goods in children's everyday play situations when they are in their home corner uh, having a tea and they have to share the tea or they have to pour a tea for one but for the other one is finished when they have to take turns with different toys or or in different games when they when a child wants to read a book and the other child wants the very same book well perhaps we can read it together so these are all daily opportunities to to help children understand um 
to, to help children understand how the position of, of goods, um, how we can distribute mm. resources and share resources in in an in an in a sustainable way, how we mm. can somehow uh, guide them uh, towards a more equitable and, and sustainable community by 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 sh- sharing with them uh, and, and guiding them to to the fairest decision. Um, and this is also sustainability. Mm-hmm. I think that's a brilliant point to to really focus on and, and probably a great point to kind of wrap up this episode on to make sure that we do have that in our minds as educators, that it's so much wider than just sharing in that moment and avoiding that conflict. It's so much bigger than that. It's, and it's bigger than sharing, just learning to share things in the setting and at home. It, it's about, like you say, building a more equitable society and it's for the future. And it is all very much based in sustainability from that social lens. Thank you, Carmela, for addressing this once again, quite challenging topic and sharing your research and sharing some of the the words that the children spoke. Um, it's great to hear that directly coming from you, from your data. Um, so to the listeners and viewers, if you haven't already listened to the previous episodes in this series, you can find them on the Voice of Early Childhood website, along with Carmela's articles, or you can search for the Voice of Early Childhood um, on podcast streaming platforms or on YouTube. And the next episode we have is going to be the third theme, Carmela, um, is that right? Which is um, around social norms and subordination. Yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We so, will explore further, we will yes, explore further the, the, thank you. We will explore further uh, the role of the adult as well, mm-hmm. an authority figure. And so the role of the children as uh, somehow uh, the, from the subordinated position uh, mm-hmm. and, and also how children conform or inform mm-hmm. or enforce or speak out or even create uh, social norms in the, within the peer cultures. That sounds like it's a great link from this episode to, to that next one. So, yeah, looking forward to that. Thank you, Carmela. And thank you to all of the listeners for tuning in. And we'll hear from you again soon, Carmela. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you very much. All.